When I talked about Zulu, which is here or here or wherever, I mentioned that the timpani was the driving instrument, the motor that propelled the whole score forward and gave it a sense of scale. That got me thinking about other John Barry scores. He's my favourite composer and it was his music for the James Bond series, as well as John Williams and his music to the Star Wars trilogy that cemented my interest in film scores. Anyway, enough about me. What I'm wondering is whether the John Barry James Bond scores have an instrument like Zulu's timpani that became one of the paint pots that John Barry used to draw his musical canvas. From Russia with love was John Barry's first full 007 score. Whilst the title song was written by Lionel Bart, control over the score's architecture would enable John Barry to decide how and where to use the song melody and, of course, write his own music. The contemporaneous soundtrack album featured a generous 18 tracks and many of them feature the double bass in what we'd loosely call a jazz mode. This is more accurately termed upright bass or acoustic bass and it's usually played pizzicato rather than arco which is with the bow. Tracks such as Tanya Meets Kleb, The Golden Horn and James Bond with bongos really highlight the double bass. And we can't forget the importance of John Barry's Mission in Progress answer to the James Bond theme titled 007. Here, the double bass marks time in unison with the timpani. The runner-up is the acoustic guitar, which is also great in this score. What's the most standout thing about the Goldfinger score and title song? Of course, it's the golden brass instruments. In particular, the trumpets which are often played with plunger mutes, giving us that wah, 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 wah sound. If they're not in plunger or cup mute mode, then they're about as boisterous as it could possibly get. But let's give a well-deserved tip of the hat to the entire screaming brass section, the French horns and saxophone for giving Goldfinger such an exciting, brash and strident sound. It's now nearly 60 years old, and it's still thrilling and endlessly entertaining music. In Thunderball, John Barry scores the mystique and adventure of a film with many underwater scenes. His main pot of colour is reverberant flutes, and it's perfect. It's somehow airy yet weighty, exotic yet comfortable light yet dark. Barry is often setting his Mr. Kiss Kiss Bang Bang melody on the flute and if it's not a foreground device it's often repeating an ostinato to accompany the harpsichord, the strings and vibraphone. He's even using the flute extensively in the loungy source music. Speaking of the vibraphone it's a runner-up for this score as it makes a regular appearance and is also perfect for evoking secret underwater activities. In You Only Live Twice, John Barry crafts a superb score, and it's one of my very favourites. The title song is easily one of his very best, with breathtaking string writing combining with Leslie Brekus's perceptive and yearning lyrics quite the antithesis of the Goldfinger and Thunderball songs. In keeping with the then exotic locale of Japan, John Barry paints gorgeous musical pictures with atypical instruments for a standard symphony orchestra. However, one typical symphony instrument can be heard often and it's the gong, aka the tam-tam. The gong is pretty much everywhere in the score, sometimes adding an exotic feel, sometimes creating a sense of urgency in action sequences. 
consider the Nancy Sinatra title song. The very first note is the gong in unison with the low strings. Consider the cue Capsule in Space, the second track on the album. The first note again is the gong. And the first note of the track after that is the gong as well. In fact, John Barry's original 1967 album has only three of 12 tracks that are completely devoid of the gong. And one of them, Tanaka's World, isn't even in the film. The runner up here is the tuba. It's used in the title song and so many other places. For On Her Majesty's Secret Service, John Barry makes clever use of the then relatively new Moog synthesizer. By the way, Robert Moog said his name pronounced Moog despite the double O G rather than double O seven, of course. So start banging out your complaints in the comments below. Anyway, John Barry used the Moog a little bit in the main title to The Lion in Winter and part of his Midnight Cowboy score. But for Her Majesty's, it's an important and frequently occurring color. The Moog is prominent during the title music, the pulse pounding theme that also accompanies the ski chase scenes. Here it plays in low registers, doubling the strings. But you may have also noticed the Moog right out the very start of the film, replacing the guitar associated with Sean Connery and playing the James Bond theme, introducing the then new 007. One of the most ingenious uses of the Moog is the Morse code sounding sonar pings in Over and Out. It's genius. It's an inspired creative color and an excellent choice for this film. In Diamonds Are Forever, John Barry gives us a tinkly diamond sound courtesy of the rightmost keys of an electronic organ. It's a seductive sound in the Shirley Bassey title song and it's peppered throughout the score, sometimes with neurons rather than being overt and flagrant. My favourite is in 007 and Counting, which is one of the best cues from the entire James Bond series. Here the tinkling diamond sound accompanies the space laser as Blofeld takes control of it and commences zapping things. John Barry's lush unison string lines, his brass choir and his ability to seamlessly switch between the exterior and interior scenes demonstrates the work of a master composer and arranger. John Barry took his first leave of absence from the series with Live and Let Die, but he returned for The Man with the Golden Gun. The colour here is obviously the slide whistle. No, 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 no. That does seem to detract a bit from an otherwise very impressive car stunt. It's actually a little harder to say what the standout colour in The Man with the Golden Gun actually is. This might be why the Lulu song is generally towards the bottom of fan lists, even if the hastily composed underscore is so much better than the hastily composed song. I'm tempted to say drums, as in drum kit. The drums drive the action treatments of the James Bond theme and the Golden Gun melody. And of course, they're part of the excellent jazz renditions of the Golden Gun theme for the Funhouse sequences where they also punctuate the editing. I feel that John Barry was missed on The Spy Who Loved Me, despite having an excellent and still excellent song 45 years later, the underscore sometimes seems a bit sparse and thin compared with what John Barry usually adorned us with. Probably the reason it's the only Bond score that was completely redone for the album. Please don't hate me, I love it still, but just not as much. However, John Barry was back in action for Moonraker and he bestowed us one of his best tracks ever, the six and a half minute Flight Into Space. The standout thing about Moonraker is the use of chorus, providing an otherworldly and heavenly sound which is perfect for a film that tells us an actual filming location was outer space. Check the end credits if you don't believe me. 
John Barry's final three Bond scores were back-to-back, -back, starting with Octopussy in 1983. For Octopussy, I feel that the musical colour isn't an instrument or orchestration choice per se, rather an engineering one. This is the last James Bond film score that John Richards engineered. It was an incredible run of 007 scores that started with You Only Live Twice and ran up to Octopussy, with the exclusion of Moonraker, which was recorded in Paris. In the year following Octopussy, plans were made to remodel both the acoustic space and control room at CTS Studios in Wembley, a project that was completed in 1985, by which time John Richards had emigrated to the USA. What we have in Octopussy is the classic CTS Wembley and John Richards combination, the tight miking, the gloriously wide stereo panning and delayed plate echo. Don't believe me? Listen to the snare drum and the trumpets. John Richards knew the studio so well that he could split an orchestra across 20 tracks of tape, and if you brought each of them up level, pan them out and added echo, you'd have a very impressive starting point. A View to a Kill saw Duran Duran delivering one of the more popular title songs in the series. John Barry delivered a score with an action framework reminiscent of Honor Majesty's Secret Service. His highlighting colour this time was the wailing electric guitar that is thankfully expertly mixed, relatively unobtrusively, so that it doesn't become overbearing. In John Barry's final 007 contribution, he brings his A-game. The score for The Living Daylights is a deft combination of everything we love about John Barry and his Bond scores. The lush strings, the brassy action cues, the great melodies, the romantic themes. This time, John Barry rests his musical canvas upon a synthesized rhythm track. These tracks add an intense energy, a sense of pace and excitement for the then new James Bond actor, Timothy Dalton. Some 35 years later, the drum sound can certainly be critiqued as a little dated, but the freshness and the crispness still hold up. So, what do you think? Does this all sound like a load of bull, or is it as bad as listening to the Beatles without earmuffs? Until next time, choose your next listening session carefully, Mr. Bond. It may indeed be your last. And time for me to get out of the rain. Thanks for watching. Happy listening.